Good afternoon, nerd fam, and welcome back to snowy Salt Lake City, Utah. We're here barreling through day one of three <laughs> days of coverage of KubeCon North America. My name is Savannah Peterson with my favorite co-pilot, Rob Streche, steering the plane here to a very exciting conversation up next, but we've had a cool morning. Very cool morning, and I think, again, it's just, even just, you know, comparing this back to Paris and how many advances we've made and how much people are leaning into AI and where you see, yeah, a lot of is being done on bare metal and Linux at in the big hyperscale type GPU deployments, a lot of the enterprise is looking towards Kubernetes and like in a big way for being able to do their AI, which is perfect for what we're about to talk to. I know, I'm really excited. We've got two CUBE VIP veterans over here, both from Paris and from Chicago, I believe is where I saw you. I think you. so. Yeah, so we've got Sally and Jeremy. Thank you both for taking the time. Awesome, thank you for having us. Yeah, super busy week for both of you, I know, to the point where you're already starting to lose your voice, Sally, poor thing. I know, that's we, why I have my tea here. You're good, we've got your mics, don't even All worry right. about that. You could be whispering and we'd be able, to, be able to hear you. But I'm super excited. One of the things that struck me right away when we had a chance to chat and, and what we were getting set up is how much your role has changed over the last year. Year. I mean, and that's not that long of a time. It feels no. like it's been 10 years in, in Techland, do you, though? At least. And I think that's reflective also of some of the shifts and, and, and true focus right now of what's going on at Red Hat. Tell me a little bit about the journey and what you're working on right now. Yeah, so what's happening right now is data scientists have been doing their thing for a decade, longer, and uh, us software engineers have been doing our thing. Data scientists don't really know a lot about containers and how to deploy things. And I don't know a lot about data science. So this past year has been us coming together and uh, really creating solutions for now that we have these LLMs that are going to change the world. How do we deploy them? How do we scale them? How do we make them accessible to everybody? And that's what we've been working on at Red Hat. It really is, it's a culture of collaboration, but I think this whole community is about celebrating collaboration. Jeremy, I know that's something that you're very passionate about and something that you've been working on since the last time I saw you only six months ago. Two new working groups, a whole lot going on. Give us the breakdown. Yeah, so um, in the Paris timeframe, so the March, uh, February of 24 timeframe, uh, it was pretty obvious that the killer workload for the next couple of years for Cube was going to be some flavor of inferencing and uh, that requires you know, very particular management of hardware that uh, is sort of new to Kubernetes. And so we, in order in a true sort of open source fashion, we uh, worked together to spin up a couple of working groups to do this. Go back eight or nine years, we had similar things in Kubernetes for, uh, we did the resource management working group uh, which was folded into Signode eventually, and then we also did which, uh, something called a network plumbing working group, and the idea behind that one was we understand some really heavy hitter workloads need specialized networks, and so that plumbing is in place and has gotten downstream into product. We're now seeing, and that was kind of workload agnostic. Now that we have a particular workload that has sucked all the oxygen out of the room and the execs have our attention and so forth, we can go back to some of those principles and what we did in that time frame earlier this year was spin up working group serving and uh, working groups device management. And each one of those has a different focus. So device management being how do we uh, drive efficiency at a density for the utilization of, of these really exotic hardware, let's call it, and maybe just Plainly speaking, it's expensive. Yeah, also, exotic was a really yeah. choice word there, though. I loved that. That was like an exotic car rather than just saying it's exorbitantly yeah. expensive. That was well played, Jerry. Very, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I don't write checks around here, so it's fine by me. Let's call them exotic. So, yeah. they're, they're, so they're handling like DRA, that's where DRA is coming in. Um, and I'll come back to DRA in a second. And then in working group serving uh, is where we're trying to, let's talk about an engineering KPI like cost per million tokens served. And what technologies do we, are we missing right now to drive that number down? Let's call it two orders of magnitude. Some, some, some number to make it actually uh, open up the market for people that can come in and actually not make it this have and have not scenario. I can talk more about working group serving in a second. Um, one thing we're doing in the DRA space is, and DRA and, uh, was part of our OpenShift Commons keynote yesterday along with a, a, another technology out of IBM Research called InstaSlice. 
And Insta Slice is, uh, is attempting to solve this problem while DRA matures. So it's got the same, it will eventually be replaced by DRA once that sort of thing comes up in feature spec. But our customers are asking for it now, so we'll have a time-bound solution for it. That's a really exciting thing, and all of that is open, as you can imagine. Yeah. Um, and uh, and we, yeah, we just demoed it live. So you can do really impressive efficiency and density improvements, all cube native. Which is compelling and matters, and speaking of doing that, yeah. driving cost and complexity down, something everyone in this room wants to have to see happen. You hear every company, they want AI to, to, to be easy to deploy, or Kubernetes, or whatever it is that we're talking about in our, in our product development. Yeah. How does the open source community help a, a big company like Red Hat do that efficiently? Yeah, uh, well, Jeremy was talking about collaboration with IBM Research. Yeah. One of the other projects we've been collaborating with IBM on is Instruct Lab. So Instruct Lab is an open source project where you can take a small, by small I mean seven or eight billion parameter LLM. Casual or small. Tiny. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you can bring your, your own data to it easily. You know, you don't need to be an expert. You don't need to hand your data off to a team of data scientists. So it enables a user to bring their data um, easily and uh, fine tune and align a smaller model to make it super useful for like a narrow, narrowly focused domain specific use case. And I really think that's where we're going with LLMs. Um, you were talking about the cost of running them and the smaller models are what's, if we can show that they can be super effective, uh, that's going to bring the cost down and make, make it more accessible to everyone. And, yeah. Yeah. and I think a lot of that's that great, has great to do with the development that you're doing. I mean, you work, you have two hats on, right? You have your, yeah. your CNCF hat, I guess you could say, in the projects, and then you also have your Red Hat developer hat on. And what you're doing is bringing a lot of this, hey, we need to support other things like different GPUs or different, uh, different providers and things of that nature. Kind of talk to how you're building that in because I think you know, it kind of is a bridge between where you were a year ago and where we're going, which is, hey, these smaller language models, not the one, two trillion, but hey, I'm going to train these uh, on my data mm -hmm. and I'm going to then put them out at the edge or something like that where you know, maybe it's on RHEL AI or on OpenShift AI to be able to you know, serve my customers more directly. Right, and what we've been doing at Red Hat is providing this like trusted, consistent uh, way of moving things around and you know deploying things everywhere. Um, that's what we've always done. And uh, so, like with Rel AI, same tools, same packages, same models um, are going into OpenShift AI, so that um, you get that consistent. Uh, um, experience and our light, all of our light speed uh, offerings are, you know, making sure those feel the same across our products. Like those are things that we're working working on at Red Hat today. I think getting to small language models is a, a necessary conclusion. Um, I think yeah. we're, what we're seeing is that customers are looking for the foundation models to provide them with the basic knowledge, arithmetic, how to speak certain languages. Uh, and then want to have operate on their own proprietary data in a very controlled fashion. So that's where the small language models come in. They obviously have a cost impact. Um, what, where, where the sort of bleeding edge of research is now is making sure that we don't lose fidelity or quality um, as we try and use smaller and smaller models. So like, IBM shipped a bunch of smaller models called Granite 3, I think a month ago. Yep. Uh, and they're down to a 2.6 billion parameter model. Um, and the question is what use cases might a smaller models be useful for and what, in what scenarios do you need actually larger models? Uh, and then do we even have the hardware to serve these other things? So um, one, one thing we're adding to OpenShift AI at the moment is distributed inferencing uh, using uh, RayServe from AnyScale, mm -hmm. uh, another open source project. And we use Ray for uh, training already inside OpenShift AI uh, Ray, uh, through CubeRay. Uh, so, these, all these things coming together slowly are opening, again, we're just, we're increasing the uh, market and we're trying to meet the market where they want to be, which is a cost number that doesn't turn them sheet white uh, and, uh, and, and allows them to continue to have faith in Red Hat and IBM from a security standpoint. I'm really glad you mentioned that. It's a huge yeah. leg in the stool. 
data transparency is a huge leg in the stool. We saw the OSI recently ship a open source definition for AI, and it's, <laughs> let's just say that that needs to evolve in a certain way. Um, and I think there's other frameworks that may make sense to couple with it. Uh, one we're looking at is called the model openness framework. So those conversations are for lawyers mostly, uh, but, <laughs> but as I understand, like when you ask an LLM and you get an answer you don't expect back, that's, that, to me that's how users see data transparency, not so much through the legal lens. Yeah, yeah. I, I think you bring up a good point. It goes to our earlier chuckly conversation about the, the pizza and cheese sliding off in the glue. That's, that's an interesting, a, a, a harmless example of data transparency, although don't eat glue, please don't eat glue, folks. I'm actually just going to say that right now. We don't need a Tide Pod moment. <laughs> but, but, I, but, I, but I think you're absolutely right about that in terms of transparency. Something I want to bring up, Sally, I want to ask you this question. I know you have a strong, I mean, you are a developer, you have a great developer lens. And, and mm -hmm. when, when Jeremy was talking about why it's so beneficial to work with open source projects, both of you actually, in, in terms of driving down cost and complexity, this question is not expected, but it, it came up as I was thinking about this. Do you think that some of these open source projects are so widely adopted by big companies like Red Hat or, or some of the huge massive enterprises that we see here behind us because they're essentially for developers by developers? There's been, there's, there's been the mindfulness to make it not as complex out the gate in terms of building out these projects? Yeah, I, I guess so. Um, with open source, it's just like, it's at the core of everything we do at Red Hat. Like it's what we were founded on. It's, you can't really separate. I can't even think about not being open source because I've been at Red Hat for 10 years. Um, it's just how we do things. It's how we know it is the right way to do things. It's the only way. I love it's that. where all innovation happens. It's so, I'm not sure I answered your question, but uh, we're all did. very yeah. passionate yeah. about open source at Red Hat. Uh, one point I wanted to make is that we have this backstage uh, open source thing from Spotify. Uh, huge Spotify fan, but they're, they're, especially what they did with backstage. Uh, yeah. we, we productized that through, we call it developer hub. Here's where I can see us going. Um, when, I was, when I was with you in Paris, I said, I asked you a question. I said, do you think there'll be an eventual maturity of the data science persona and the ML ops persona into something new and unique? Uh, I see that actually happening before our eyes, yeah. and one of the ways we're kind of trying to catalyze that is, is recasting the data scientist as, as, a, as a bit of, a, more of a developer per persona. And so if we can use things like Backstage to, so an LLM is useless without an app with it. They, they're essentially developed together by potentially different people. Them converging on a platform like OpenShift AI or others and utilizing Backstage to provide the sort of governance around it and templating and developer efficiency around it, mm -hmm. that's what gets us to that mindset where like, I don't have to fight with the tooling very much. So it's your point about developers for developers, that's what Backstage is. Yeah. Uh, if we want to talk about developers for developers more, um, Podman Desktop has a, a AI, this is something that I've worked on over the last year, the AI lab for Podman Desktop. It's this amazing, um, tool that you can just launch local um, LL, local LLM powered applications uh, you know and see them in your browser and I teach a course at Boston wow. yeah at Boston University that makes it so accessible oh yeah so I teach a course at Boston University it's software engineering career prep and I have 40 students and last week we introduced Podman Desktop AI Lab. They're like a mix of Windows and Mac users. And so I got to see them all um, download the model. It's a GGUF model, quantized model, like four gig. That's what these Podman AI Lab models are. Um, download them from Hugging Face. And uh, it took like 15 minutes because the Wi-Fi at you know, these <laughs> universities is so slow. So we had to wait and wait. So and the like, terriers need better Wi-Fi. That's totally what you're trying to sorry, say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know you no, hate no to BU. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love BU. They're great. Uh, and then as the um, LLM was downloaded, it was a matter of then building the model server. And the students got to see that, okay, an AI application requires a model and like a file server for it, a model server. And so that's running. And then they get their front end, this little streamlit chatbot. And they go to the local browser and they're just learning like what a port is. And so they put it in and they the, the chatbot is live and like you see them light up. And 
that's how I know like we're onto something really special here. And it's actually the same thing I experienced in college back in the 90s when Linux came about. You know, I had a lot, I didn't study computer science in college. I had a lot of friends who um, did and they were so excited about Linux. I remember they showed me this like said command line thing and like I could tell that was really special. And that's something that has kept with me and why I went back to the industry all those years later. Yep. It, it's, it's about making it real. I mean, the yeah. experience you just described is when somebody realizes they have the power to build anything they it's want. That hello world moment that like never goes away for developers, right? That aha moment for Instruct Lab. I mean, I, I yeah. will I will never forget it. Um, it was the type of thing where like someone was wrong on the internet, and I had to, and I was able to fix it myself. It's oh, just yeah. an empowering. It's just so you empowering. Did it? Yeah. You did it with a baseball team. And I did it with the, the hockey club in Salt Lake City. There's a new <laughs> NHL team in Salt Lake City, so I, oh, cool. I used oh, yeah, Instruct Lab. Tonight. They're yeah. playing oh. the Hurricanes tonight. Yeah. Oh, I wonder if there's tickets. Anyways, there are tickets. For, I know the production former guys Former Coyotes, because yeah. they used to be at ASU, so that's where they used to play. But yeah, go so ahead. I yeah. trained uh, the LLM to know about the Utah Hockey Club. The oh, first nice. time I asked it about it, it was like, oh, it's a recreational um, <laughs> team that was founded in like 1920. And then I trained it and it was like the Utah Hockey Club was started in 2024, 2020. So I'm like, it works. <laughs> you know, not, not that I didn't know it worked, but. It yeah. still has that magical, <laughs> there is that magical feeling. No, I, yeah. know, I, I know exactly what you mean. I used to work in 3D printing and the first time your digital design becomes a physical yeah. object. That was my favorite part of the experience was watching someone hold their, having pressed print on your brain. And that's essentially what you're doing with this as well. It's Yeah, and okay, so Red Hat is like a whole company of people like this. And like we're truly excited about open source and the possibilities. And right now we're creating a new playground for ourselves. That's yeah. going to be here for decades There's, to the come. The business people are going to come calling at some point. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's <laughs> fine because you know what? Great open source projects create great products. You know, the healthier the, the community is, the open source community, the easier it is You to put create. that one on a T for me so I can jump in. There's, there's adjacent awesome. communities that matter too. Um, so PyTorch, which is yeah. not necessarily under CNCF, but is going to be critical. And then Linux Foundation AI and data. Um, incidentally, that's where VLLM is going to be incubated, which is a key. VLLM uh, is VLLM is yes, a, the a key VLLM. technology yes, the, for yeah. us. That's yeah. exciting. Part of our, I keep calling it the LAMP stack for AI. Um, yeah. So VLLM will be one of those. PyTorch will be one of those. And the key piece is there's those are demo, those are ecosystems that we feel safe participating in that have you know governance in place and stuff like that where. Um, where we can get an equivalent seat at the table. So PyTorch in the future, integrations with, between CNCF projects and PyTorch is going to be critical. And then there's, there's other ecosystem projects like Langchain and others that have to have to be wired into those sort of, I think, in those governance things ideally. Well, I, I, again, we, we, there's nothing to talk about yet, but you guys are making investments in that VLLM space as well with acquisitions, and we'll talk about that probably in London, like, you know, yeah, yeah. down the road when actually it's real and stuff like that. But I think what's interesting is, like you said, again, it's getting turned into, you know, support for AMD, support for other GPUs, for light, later for Intel, for some of the GPUs already doing NVIDIA, the time slicing and being able to use that. You're trying to give the easy button to organizations Absolutely. as part yeah. of that one as well. One of the key pieces, one of the key differentiators I think that REL AI provides is all of the uh, NVIDIA stack. Yep. Built in, completely QE'd by us, supported by both companies. Yep. That's an easy button to the extent we could do it so far, and we're just going to keep, that's a blueprint that works for our customers, and they don't want to fight with that. We did our best on Kubernetes with the GPU operator that NVIDIA ships, so we do, that's all fine. But being able to embed it and QE it on site would not have a build, not ship a build chain, that's an entirely different supply chain security story that we can start telling yes. for our customers. Great. Right. Wow, right. what an exciting time, okay. I have one last question for you because That's definitely, it? I know, I know I we're actually right. already over time, but this has been fascinating. I could talk to you all for the whole <laughs> afternoon. Your poor voice might not make it, but it's done well so far. What do you hope to be able to say? Because obviously so much has changed since the last time I had the pleasure and honor of talking to both of you. Yeah. What do you hope to be able to say next time we get to sit down, whether that's in London or Atlanta or both, that you can't yet say today? And obviously you don't have to you know, violate any privacy or anything, but what, what are you hoping to see within the community? Oh gosh, you want to go first? No. The two areas that are super interesting to me is sort of the bookends for Instruct Lab are evaluation frameworks and, and like data transforming, data engineering, ETL side. So those are, so Instruct Lab itself requires data as an input. And then we, be, we, need, we really do need to be able to apply sort of traditional 
um, software engineering discipline to the evaluation frameworks. By the next time we are it together, uh, we have a really interesting project which went from like zero to 8,000 GitHub stars in like a week called Dockling. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, first of all, that is a, quite an impressive. That's pretty wild. I was going to mention that. That is yeah. wild. I'm glad oh. someone remembered. Yeah, so Dockling is the um, around the data ingestion piece. You know, I said you, within Struck Lab, you the user can bring their own data. Well, right now it requires the user to know a little bit about Git and a little bit about YAML. We want anyone to be able to contribute their data. You know, we don't want that to be an obstacle. And Dockling is a project that's going to kind of abstract that away. Oh, so, cool. yeah. Wow. So no, I mean, it's not surprising just, that everyone got so excited about it right away. Yeah, and, yeah. and you know, it was it was well built with like this team is not new um, that built it. They've been doing image recognition and, and um, data transform for many years uh, out of Zurich, I believe. So people who look at it, who know, understand this is a team that isn't, isn't from scratch. Um, so does, maybe that's one of the reasons. At the same time, it's an open source project. Anyone can take it and use it today. It'll be, you know, we're thinking about productizing it as the sort of ingest side of the problem and Red Hat tries to solve yeah. that. Yeah. Oh, exciting. What about you, Sally? Anything you want to be able to say secretly? Uh, I actually was going to talk about making data ingestion easier and making that oh, more perfect. accessible to everyone. Well, it yeah. came up. We're, we're it did, it did. <laughs> what a lovely great. team, the two of you are. Jeremy and Sally, thank you so much for hanging out. It <laughs> really is it really is a pleasure, and I feel like we get to learn so much from you both. And Rob, same, likewise with that, yep. you're always full of fun facts. Like always fun. I know, always fun. I hope all of you are having fun, wherever you might be, on this beautiful day here, day one of KubeCon in North America in Salt Lake City, Utah. My name is Savannah Peterson. You're watching theCUBE, the leading source for enterprise tech news.